Can everyone hear me? Good. So I know everyone's trying to move from their tables. I want to have a full crowd here. And I will tell you, I love, love, love talking to each one of you individually when I speak. While this may sound like your presentation, it really is a conversation. So if I don't know you, I might tap you on the shoulder and ask you a question. Don't get offended. It's just about making sure that we get along very well. So all of you who are out there, if you can come and have a seat. And we're going to jump right in and have a conversation around branding. So can anyone tell me what they think branding is? Any ideas? Anyone? Like, what do you think branding is? It's standing out, she says. Do you agree with me that it's more than just your name and more than just your profile photo and your bio agree? Do everyone agree? Do you raise your hand if you agree with me to that? Do you agree that it's often formed before anyone even meets you, right? What about the essence of who you are? If you think about some of the logos, think about Apple's logo. Think about Nike's logo. What do you think they're trying to do with their brand? The most recognizable logo, I think, still to the day, I think it's the Nike logo, I think. What they're doing with their logo, all they did, they're trying to evoke a piece of emotion from you. Because when you have something that's emotional, it tends to make you want to lean in and want to actually make that purchase. Think about Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Who do you think has the best brand? Anybody? What do you think? Pepsi, you think has the best brand? Now, I will admit I have not looked this up today. But I will say, if you look at past historical data, and I saw your head shake here, Coca-Cola sells more drink than Pepsi. However, when you do a taste test, who do you think wins? Pepsi does, right? Why do you think Coca-Cola sells more, though? They have a better brand. When people see that Coca-Cola logo, it evokes some emotional context with us to the point that we decide we want to make that purchase, even though it tastes different or sometimes, and some people may say, it doesn't taste as good as Pepsi because we don't really go with what our taste is. We almost never do. We go with a feeling. We always, we, like right now, I kid you not, I'm still strongly considering getting in line at 4 a.m. to get the new iPhone 6 Plus. And I do it every year. I usually wait about seven to eight hours in line. Why do you think we do that? Because we want that product. And that's the emotional connection that we need. It happens whether you define it yourself, you let others do it, or if you don't bother to do it at all. Branding is always happening. When you or your friends or associates connect online, there's a brand. Once even one or two of your colleagues or friends do it, there's a brand. And if, even if you're not there, there's a brand. It's always going to be there. Why do you think we're talking about this now in terms of career? LinkedIn, obviously, yes. But it's also because there's a change in the guards that's happening in America. You have baby boomers right now. Every day, about 10 or 11,000 of them are turning 65. That will continue for the next 18 years. And even if they don't retire, what do you think the average lifespan in America is? You're all health people. What do you think? About 75, 80, right? So if you look at what's happening the next 10 to 15 years, a huge exodus in our work environment. Gen X, which is my generation, eh, about 42 to 46 million of us. And Gen Y, which is a lot of you in the room, it's about 80 to 87 million of you. And the whole point of why we're talking about this is because we need you to understand you're who we want to hire, but we don't think some of you are ready yet because we've seen some things you've done, like Snapchat. How many of you know what that is? I know all of you do, right? And by the way, you assume that because it's only available for seven seconds, that means I don't get to see it. But as a recruiter, I definitely get to see it. There's ways to find that, even though you don't think there is. There will be another countdown happening, and this one in living rooms across this country. At the stroke of midnight, a tidal wave of baby boomers turns 65, and we did the math today. That's one boomer every eight seconds turning 65, and the number coming in the next year, 2.8 million baby boomers who will turn that mark. In the time it takes you to watch this next report from John Donvan, in fact, that would mean another 15 of those boomers having a birthday. Here's John. Ships laden with veterans. First came optimism, then came the babies. The torch has been passed. Then, 65 years went by. 
between the amount of money that's coming in. Bringing us to this day we have out, fretted about. Will only get worse as the baby boomers age. For some time, really. There's a lot of baby boomers. Really, some time. When the baby boomers retire. Well, when is now? actually tomorrow, because the boomer generation, that huge reproductive uptick, 1946 to 64, that gave us 76 million new Americans, its first members turn 65 tomorrow, January 1st, retirement age, Social Security and Medicare age. So happy birthday, because we know what that means, 76 million more to come with more boomer demand because it's by their demands that boomers have shaped our culture. They needed schools, we built them schools. Those red brick jobs churned out in the 50s, everywhere. And all those products that told kids, you're consumers, well, they consumed. After first spiking sales of diapers and baby food and driving the creation of the first TV shows made just for kids, for them. What time is it? Who made this moment on Ed Sullivan? Close your eyes and I'll kiss you. Sure, the guys on stage, but the kids in the seats, too. Look at those faces. They want, they need. And on they would go demanding. Demanding to end a war which part of them served in. Demanding rights, different kinds of rights, and getting them. And as they aged, their demand built houses across the land and pushed education levels higher and stock markets up for a good long while. And now all they want, all they need, are untold trillions of dollars for Medicare and Social Security, payable by the generations that follow. Oh, once again, happy birthday. John Donvan, ABC News, Washington. My favorite part about that video is when they say, look at them, they want, they need. And I think that the important part of that is to understand of why our current work environment looks the way it is. It was built completely to really embody all the baby boomers. Every single thing that we do is around that generation right now. When you think about, um, and a lot of you may, in or may, or may or may not have had your first job, but think about, for example, when you go do online training. If you understand baby boomers love a lot of awards and a lot of plaques on their walls because that generation was very, very, very um, uh, competitive. There were 80 million of them. So it wasn't just about five people doing a great job, it was about, okay, all of them are trying to do a great job because all of them want the corner office, all of them want the promotion. So it's all about, if you look at a baby boomer's office, you typically, typically will see plaques, trophies, that kind of stuff because they want to make sure not only did I do a good job, but everyone else knew I did a great job because that equals a promotion. Not surprised when you go online, you do online training, you press at the end of that training, there's a button that says, what do you want to do? Print a certificate, right? Who do you think that's for? A baby boomer. But we're now changing. Right now, it's about Gen Y. Right now, it's about trying to figure out what ticks, what makes you really want to come work for companies. Why would you even want to come work at City of Hope? How can we make an environment so you're as inclusive of all of you because you really are our next leaders? But at the same time, we don't want baby boomers to feel left out because we really want them to stay on board as long as they can, as long as they want to. It's not about a huge exodus of telling they can't be here. It's trying to be inclusive of everyone. But these generations look different. We see how baby boomers, what really, uh, spin, what really resonated with them. But when you look at Gen Y, this is what they look like. Yeah. Now I'm in the blogosphere, now I'm in the Twitterverse Fans get so immersed, but I'm a nerd forever I'm the new Zuckerberg, and since my website I've been cooking dough like a chef serving kilobytes Used to be the basement, back at my mom's place Building web traffic so that we could sell an ad space Make way for the one-man businesses Bailouts finished with white-collar criminals New Sega Genesis, entrepreneur Time making big plans to dominate the online Yeah, I'm on YouTube is one man sharing Google revenue with songs on my webcam. Science is the new art, databases day to day. Geek spreading sheet smarts, hustle make the data pay. I could be in Vabby Wag plus Geekology. Tell from my avatar that I'm most definitely Right on the home. 
Grammys, and I'm up in Mashable. We got trips to New York, Bar Pity, One Oak, parties full of new door. Now I'm pitching business plans from the backs of napkins. Micro lent to Africans, monetize Kazakhstan. Catch me up on LinkedIn, dog. CEO, you can see where I be with the IPO. Now I'm up in skinny jeans, now a hipster's lurking. Used to be a reject, but now I'm steady jerking. Now my glass is mainstream, now the girlies eyeing me. Popular kids copy me, the new swag is irony. Coming from the small time, girls couldn't find me. Now I scale models like I climb on top of Heidi. Starting big trends with the tweets that I pass on. You should follow me, cause I'm friends with Ashton. My favorite part about that, and it really is a big telling about this generation, whereas in previous generations, you saw a lot of formality, especially with matures and baby boomers, that if you were my boss, I would definitely go to you first before I go to the VP, before I go to the senior VP, before I go to the CEO. But you notice in the video, he says, you should follow me because I'm friends with Ashton. What has changed in this new world of social media is now I have direct access with the CEO. If you look at companies like, uh, let's say, LinkedIn or let's say Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg actually sits, not in a big huge office, but he sits right there with everyone else because his generation says, we don't really care so much about the titles as much as we care about the fact that we're getting work done. And so you can see how that could really be a little different for depending upon where you're working, how that could be completely different in terms of how we get work done. Because the perception is that you're too eager to move forward from maybe older generations, whereas you're saying, well, no, we're all equal, right? It should be okay. So in this new world, it's really about trying to figure out how do I use social media to really showcase my brand? And why do you think you would want to do that? Why do you think it's important to cut through all that noise? I would say so you can speak for yourself. Because if I don't find something on you online, positively or negatively, I create a negative impression in my mind about who you are. It's human nature. Because in the world today that we're working in, everyone's online. And if you're not, someone put you online. You may not have done it, but trust me, I tag people all day long on Facebook. So if I can't find you, that tells me you're purposely not trying to be found. And then I start to think, why? I start thinking, you must have done something really bad. So I want to find out what it is. So I think it's important to make sure you tell your own story. And this is why.
talked about the attention span. How many of you were shocked by that? Um, if you think about it in terms of our current world, if you see a YouTube clip that's three minutes long, you're probably like, I'll watch it, right? If it's seven minutes long, you're like, absolutely not. If it's 20 minutes long, it's like, what, are they crazy? Even the movie, movie production companies have figured this out. The motion picture uh, industry itself has made a decision that even trailers in the movie theater are too long. So they've told them it has to be two minutes or less. And I think that goes into effect, I think it's now or maybe next year. All of that's because, because of all this technology, because of all the stuff we're doing, we are so, everything's gotta be instant. Everything has to be immediate and everything has to be quick. And that's because of the new generation coming on board because they've always had technology available to them. It's been instant, it's been quick. It's been in their pockets. All of us usually, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a cell phone and I don't know anyone who doesn't have an iPhone. If you do, don't tell me, sorry. <laughs> but I'm a huge iPhone fan. Um, but it's really about trying to make sure you're there where everyone is right now. For those of you who might not be on social media, and it's okay if you're not, I am curious, what are your, some of your fears? Is anyone brave enough to tell us? And it's no judgment. I am curious, are there anyone in the room who's not using social media, you're not using social media? What are your fears? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay, because we want everyone to hear you. It's okay. okay. I mean, it's it's not that I'm afraid of it. It's like, I, I don't get it. it yeah. It's a way, to me, it's a waste of time. So let me ask you a question. I'm assuming that you are in email in your work environment, right? Yes. And do you think that's a waste of time? Yes. You think it's a waste of time, but you still do I it? Think, I think it can be. But you still do it? Well, I answer emails for work purposes. Right. I don't, again, those... You know, send this email and something great will happen to you in 20 minutes. Not, not, not that. that. Not that. Okay, I get what so you're saying. I, mean, I get what you're saying. Because my challenge to everyone who feels like social media is a waste of time, and by the way, your opinion is shared by a lot of folks. So I thank you for being brave enough to share that because a lot of people in this room have the same thought and they don't share that. What I try to explain to people is communication has changed. The only difference is we're using a different platform. We're calling it social media, but we're still communicating back and forth. Email, same kind of thing. The only difference is, is now it's just called social media. So I try to explain to people, if you use email every day, the idea that you can't use just social media every day is kind of silly. Because the same amount of time it took you to send that email, you could have also posted something on Facebook. How many of you today checked in when you came to this event to say you were here? I see a couple of hands raised. Why didn't all of you? Because you knew we were gonna have this conversation, right? And the reason why you do that is because know that if I'm a recruiter working at City of Hope, I'm looking for great talent. I'm looking for folks, folks who are engaged. How would I know that if you were not even here? How would I not know if you didn't check in, if you didn't tweet, if you didn't do all that stuff? Because I can promise you when I see that, I'm like, oh, that's someone who wants to work here. Immediately it makes an impression in my mind. It's about your brand. It's not just you an applicant applying for a job. I now know your name is Sarah and you did the X, Y, and Z. So when you finally come meet with me, I'm like, oh yeah, I know what you did, that's awesome. Thank you. That's why you do it. Some people say they do, they don't, they're not on social media because of identity theft, sharing too much of personal information. We talked about that. Uh, gone are the days where I just went to get coffee. Nobody really does that anymore. That's the early days of Twitter. Uh, but people now share a lot more uh, uh, positive and I think a lot more substantive information. You know, the first key, the first secret I share with you is search for yourself online. Figure out what's there. Because even though you may think that you're not online, I would challenge you, I probably could find something. My question is, do you like what I find? And if you're not doing it, if you're not putting your own brand out there, then what I find, if it's not something you want, that's the impression I walk away with. So it's important to make sure you're there. The second thing I tell people is, you're responsible. Be mindful, every single thing you enter online, or every single thing that someone posts on your behalf, or every single photo that you're tagged in, you are responsible. Now I know all of us are in California, I don't know if you saw the law that says that if you're 18 years or younger, you can go to a, a, one of the companies and say, hey, remove all that data that I shouldn't have had on there. That photo, just remove that. And that will work for you for 18 years or younger. But when you're 19 or 20 and you do that, guess what? It stays there forever. 
There is no such thing as deleted. People think that is this, it never has. I'm an ex-engineer at AOL, that's where I used to work, and I can tell you, I can still find it. We actually train recruiters on exactly what to find, how to find it, even though you think it's deleted, even though you think Snapchat is this and, oh, it's only seven seconds, it only takes one screenshot, and for me to share that with one person and then it's no longer private. There is no such thing as true privacy. That only exists in a world where you share nothing. And if, for those of us in this room who are old enough to remember, we used to actually put all this stuff in something called a big old phone book, your name, your address, and we'd send it to everyone in the United States. Why did you think we would change that mentality just because we created the internet? We didn't. So you should be mindful of what you're sharing because I can still find it and it will affect your career. I'll show you a couple of examples where some folks have really, really made some bad decisions. Now to a sickening video posted online by two Domino's pizza workers. They claim it was all a harmless prank, but now they're out of work and facing criminal charges. Fair warning, many of you might find the video a little distasteful. Here's NBC's Ron Mott. Hello. This is Christy back again. It's Kitchen Confidential turned Arrested like Development. <laughs> but unlike the best-selling book detailing the less-than-glamorous stuff that goes on in restaurant kitchens, two Domino's pizza workers in North Carolina are in big trouble with the food police and the real police for making this video and posting it on YouTube. This is Michael's special Italian sandwich. In the video, one employee sticks cheese up his nose later even wiping himself with a sponge <laughs> used for dishes, all to a running play-by-play -play from his seemingly delighted co-worker. Michael is such a great star. Yes, he is. In an online statement, Domino's delivered a career-ending blow to the pair and a stern warning about the hazards of the web, saying, quote, anyone with a camera and an Internet link can cause a lot of damage. 32-year-old Michael Setzer and 31-year-old Christy Hammonds were fired and charged with distribution of prohibited foods, though they insist none of the food in question was ever served to customers. Still, the health department closed the restaurant this week to be sanitized. 125,000 employees around the country that work for us um, are, you know, all of them are doing it the right way, and, you know, two idiots get to, you know, make it a, a really hard day for a lot of us. The two are certainly not the first fast food workers whose video pranks landed them in hot water. Employees at a Burger King in Ohio and a KFC in California did so quite literally, taking a dip in the kitchen sink. The Domino's narrator, Christy Hammonds, apologized to the company in an email. Her mother said she's embarrassed by her daughter's actions and asked that her face be hidden. I thought, well, why in the world did y'all do that? And, you know, and she said, well, Mom, it was just a prank. You know, we didn't... <laughs> Send nothing out to nobody. That's why, you know, I know you wouldn't have, but it blew my mind. Food for thought. Now it's ready to be shipped to some unlucky customer. And a harsh lesson Can learned. Thank you. For today, Ron Mott, NBC News, yeah, Atlanta. So how many people you think saw their video that was posted? Uh, how many? 30 million? I would say probably a lot less than that. I'd say probably two or three million. Um, Domino's president did a video also on YouTube, sort of apologizing and talking about the company's values. How many people do you think saw that video? How many? Yeah, about 150,000. What do you think that did to their brand? I personally don't even order Domino's pizza. I really don't, and I like pizza, but I don't. It, it, I think it's important. It only takes one bad incident, and then it changes that feeling we have about you. It's like, okay, probably not the best brand I want to attach myself to. And this isn't just something that happens with younger folks. I think a lot of young people get the bad rap because people assume that you're the ones that are not really paying attention. But here's even my own generation. And hey, welcome back, folks. You know, you can't turn on the TV or hop online without hearing about another scandal connected to social media mishaps. One seemingly frivolous post can turn into a disaster in seconds. My next guest knows that all too well. She was living her dream until one picture on Twitter brought it all down. Take a look. When my college alma mater called me and asked me to be the head women's basketball coach there, I was floored. For seven months, my life, every second, consisted of this team. They became a second family. I never realized how quickly things could change. One night, after a particularly rough day, 
I decided to unwind and I attended my relative's birthday. The next day, my phone rang. It's a phone call from my boss. He had seen a photo online from the party and asked me to take it down immediately. A few days later, I was called in the president's office and I was told that I was fired effective immediately. I was stunned. One picture, one flash, and my dream job was over. This, uh, this is the photo, everybody, that caused Gwinnetta to lose her job, uh, the job that she's wanted for her entire life. Now, I want, you can watch this on your own, but I won't tell you exactly why that was so demeaning. Um, know that the straws that were used in that um, photo were actually very disgusting and very inappropriate. My point is, is this is her personal life on her personal time, but it affected her job. She lost it. It's your brand. And I remember being in college. I had a conversation with a lot of folks at City of Hope, and I remember being in college. She does a lot of crazy stuff when you're in college. It's fun. But when I did it, there was no camera around to capture all those moments. There's now a camera in everyone's pocket. Everyone now starting to, who can afford it, can now get Google Glasses. And even if you don't have Google Glasses, even the glasses you have on your face right there on the top of your head, they have at least four or five brands out there that look almost like that. You wouldn't even know that you're being recorded. I don't think you should assume that no one's not taking a picture, no one's not taking photos, and no one's not taking video. You should assume every single day of your life you are being recorded. And if you are comfortable with that image showing up online and your boss seeing it, then I'm okay with you doing what you're doing. But if you're not okay with that, you have to really start rethinking, okay, maybe I don't want someone taking a photo of me. Like, I'm very picky. People who know me know that I, when I go in public, a lot of people come up to me, oh, can I take a picture with you? And I know I'm not looking my best, I'm not doing that photo. And that's because I know they're gonna tag me online. I also know that that photo tagged is gonna be a part of the stuff that people Google me about, and I don't want that photo showing up because I know I don't look my best. I'm not saying being not being authentic, I'm saying be comfortable in understanding that you are a brand. If you look at all the stuff that's happened over this past week, the NFL, why do you think they made the terminations or the things they're making? It's only because of the brand. They knew four or five months ago that person did the bad stuff. But it was okay when no one knew. But now that everyone knows, oh, no, 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 we, that's not our brand. Because now they're losing, re losing revenue. You are walking revenue. It can go up or down. So LinkedIn, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Awesome. Because for those of you who aren't, you need to be. A lot of recruiters, that's the first place they go. <laughs> and if they can't find you, they want to know why. <laughs> Um, here's a video on why you should be there. Okay, William, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a designer because I like to trace things and color them with my markers. I want to be a scientist, a good scientist that helps people. I would be someone who hunts for treasures. I want to drive a plane because they go fast. And I want to be able to fly. But I want to be a Lego builder so I can build the biggest tree house ever. When I grow up, I want to help people. Because that's important. So the world could be better. I want to be on TV because I'm good at talking, especially about sports. I love painting and drawing. I think if I can draw on the computer, that can make me really happy. Taking pictures makes people smile, and I just want to make people smile. Picture yourself doing something that you've always wanted to do. If you can dream it, you can accomplish it. I haven't decided yet. I'm still thinking about it. Some of us are still thinking about it. Uh, it took me until my 30s to figure out what I want to do as a career. I tell people, when you finally figure out what your passion is, you should go after it. But it took me until my 30s because I grew up in a time when my mom trained me, you need to have 20 jobs because they're going to cut 19 of them. And I don't care what it is, you need a, you need a paycheck because <laughs> you can't live here <laughs> without a paycheck. 
Uh, and so now we're teaching people what I think we should have been doing all along, is that it's, it's equally as important as a paycheck is, do I like what I do? And I would submit, if you don't like what you do, the paycheck doesn't even matter. Because I've worked in a ton of jobs where I really hated it. I just did it just because I needed the paycheck. And if I really, truly, when I look at my career, look at my income, I noticed that once I got to the place where I was actually in my passion, my income went dramatically up. I mean, everyone dreams to make six figures, right? That's what we always look for. And then now seven figures, because we see Kim Kardashian on TV. <laughs> but I tell people that only happened for me when I got to my passion. And that's why LinkedIn, I think, is the most important place you can be, that you can start to share what your passion is, and start to share what your career trajectory is, and connect with folks that can really help you build your brand. The first thing you'll look at is you want to create and optimize your LinkedIn profile. This is what mine looks like. And we'll dive a little bit deeper in there to look at the headline. You want to use that headline to attract visitors. So that whole section up there, what is it that you do? Where you're located, because that's really important. If I'm looking for someone who's in LA, I need to know you're in LA. If you're in Alaska, that doesn't help me in LA because maybe I don't have a budget to move you to from Alaska. So put wherever you really are or wherever you really are uh, uh, trying to look for a job so that way you can be found. Be specific about your location industry and then include what you're seeking, You know what you're looking for. The next thing is real-time updates. Remember I talked about this whole check-in thing, did any of you do it? You'll notice that earlier today, I said, I'm looking forward to delivering the keynote address, nine secrets to branding yourself through social media and online networking. And I posted that. And a lot of people have liked it. So everyone knows where I am. I saw people shared that. My network knows that now. So not only am I sharing that with my network, my network is sharing it with their network. And that's increasing not only my brand, but also City of Hope's brand, which is what the whole point of that doing that is. Your profile and summary. How many of you know what a 30 or 90 second elevator speech is? Some of you do, which is good. And I'll boil it down to a very simple. If you can think of, you're on an elevator, and typically before, between floors is about 30 to 90 seconds. And that particular day, you have to be on the elevator with the head of administration of City of Hope. What do you say in that 30 to 90 seconds to be memorable? That's what your elevator speech is. What is it that you will say that will make that person remember your brand to the point they're like, you know what, I just met James on the elevator. I don't know that guy, but he's awesome. I want to meet him. So when I send an email to him, oh yeah, I know who you are. Come up to my office, I want to meet with you. Who are you, what you do, what you're interested in? Use multimedia. LinkedIn has made it so easy now to rope in videos, uh, photos, any projects that you've done you can now incorporate that into your LinkedIn profile. This is actually a video that shows, I put this together as my, together as my career timeline. You can see what's on my profile. And this gives people about a minute and a ninety, minute and thirty seconds, minute, you know, a minute and a half of who I am, what I've done. Because again, remember, we want quick stuff. We want to know exactly who you are. And this gives the, the ability for folks to really dive deep, deep into my profile. Because immediately you see that video, you're like, oh my gosh, I want to see who this person is. I want to know more about him. So the more you can add multimedia and photos to what your profile is to showcase your work, the better. The extras that LinkedIn has added over the last few years is you, if you speak more than one language, really important now, especially which language you think. Exactly. And I think it's important. If you speak that, I need to see it front and center. 
Because when we see the job description that says bilingual preferred, who do you think they're looking for? A Spanish-speaking person. <laughs> because that's what's driving right now our business. Test scores, courses, any patents or volunteering causes that you've done, make sure you include that information. Recommendations. I, I talked to someone yesterday, and he said, you know, I took your advice. I'm starting to make great connections, but I'm just not landing it right. Something's still in the midst. And I looked at his profile. I said, well, first of all, you only have about eh, 100 uh, connections. That's kind of unheard of in the world, because I know you know I'm more than 100 people in business. And no one's recommended you either. What does that say to me? Something's wrong. You've worked at all these places, and no one thinks you're great? I can't believe that. So reach out to your you know, leaders that you've worked with, colleagues. People in leadership are really important who can actually recommend, if you're in school still, your professors, someone you really uh, think can, uh, can really add value. Not just anyone. They need to know who you are and know your work. Add that person so they can make sure that they give you a recommendation. If you look at groups, um, very, very important. On LinkedIn, they have, right now, every company has a group. Even City of Hope has a group. How many of you have joined the group? Anyone? Awesome. <laughs> because there's where you'll start to be able to connect with leadership, with recruiters. And I can promise you, if you start providing content in those groups, those LinkedIn recruiters who have to be working for City of Hope, be like, oh my gosh, this guy named Bob, he keeps, everything he's providing is awesome. I want to call him in for an interview. I may not have a job available, but I want to get to know him now because I see what he's doing in that group. That's really important. Branding yourself as a subject matter expert. Whatever your field is, you have some knowledge to share and someone wants to get that information. That's where you can do that in those groups. Updates and birthdays matter. So I don't know how many of you, how many of you get those emails that come in every morning around 7 o'clock that's about someone's birthday, right, from LinkedIn, right? Do you do anything with them? Do you? Good. And I tell people, you should. I'll explain it like this. When I was at NBC Universal, there's a senior vice president of HR. My second year there, he had already left the company. On my birthday, he called me and said, happy birthday, James. Floored me. I, first of all, didn't know he remembered my name. Secondly, I don't even know how he got my birthday. And he called me. What do you think is going to happen if he, Jose calls me ever again for anything and he needs something? I'm going to help him because he remembered me. In this world that we're talking about, the social media world, if you haven't connected personally with an individual, you miss the whole point of the platform. The platform is about making a connection both online and in person. And it's hard to do that sometimes when you're sitting behind a computer, when you're sitting on your iPhone, you're on your iPad. But when those little reminders come in about someone's birthday or someone got a new job, you send a note and say, congratulations. They remember that. And it's not just a standard note. You should be very methodical and say, you know what? I didn't get a chance to tell you, but I noticed you just updated your profile. It would be great. I know you have a new job. I'd love to take you out for coffee. Even if they can't make coffee, they remember the offer. And that changes dramatically in, your mind, in their minds when you're looking for a new job, for example. Uh, Christy made some comments about, you know, when you're networking, it, it, the idea that it's not going to happen immediately. It almost never happens immediately. But how I ended up at NBC Universal was because of an executive who worked with me in diversity when I was at AOL Time Warner. She called me up and said, I don't know if you heard about this job. We haven't even posted yet. We haven't even created it. We don't even know what the title is. But I'd love for you to come in here and talk to us about it. For five months, we had a conversation. And then I got a call and said, can you come in on Thursday? I don't, I don't, I don't know what we're going to call you. We'll pay you X. But if you can come in on Thursday, that'd be great. By the way, that's how I started the job. Eight months later, I was hired into management role. And that was all about networking. It had nothing to do with the job posting. When the job was posted, actually my boss, my VP of talent acquisition said, yeah, there's going to be people who are going to apply. We have to go through this process, but this is your job. Be okay, it's your job. I'm like, awesome. It happens like that all the time, if you understand the art of networking. Ask yourself, if you look at the guy on the left and you look at his profile, there's pretty much nothing there. He's got a current employer. He's got some past employers. He's got one piece of education, which, by the way, I've learned from one of the tables. If you haven't gone and continued your education, probably not someone we're going to look at really much in this industry because education matters. Getting your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, your PhD, all that stuff matters in this industry. So I'm going to be looking for that information. And he has zero connections. I don't think I want to connect with him. But the guy on the right, 
oh my gosh, there's stuff there. I might want to dig deep in it. He might help me and I might be able to help him. So when you look at your profile, look at it from a stance of do I really want to connect with this person? And if you see some stuff that's amiss, you might want to look and figure out how to change it. LinkedIn publishing platform. Does anyone know what this is? Has anyone published any content on LinkedIn? LinkedIn just opened it up this year. for. So I don't know if you know about LinkedIn influencers, which typically are for CEOs, uh, people that have their own businesses. Um, I mean, it's really, really billionaire level folks. Those are the people who really write a lot of content on LinkedIn. So when you go there and you see their publishing platform, they call it Pulse, where you can get really expert knowledge and that kind of information. This year they opened it up for everyone, all of us, because things have changed. It used to be that our news came from NBC and CNN. News now comes from you. We learned about Ferguson from you. We learned about all the things pretty much now from you. And as a result of that, we realize you have more expertise in your head and in your hand than we ever thought you did. So now they're allowing us to really publish that content. And all of you should take advantage of it. Whatever your expertise is, you should unzip your mind on LinkedIn and figure out how can I share that in a way that elevates, elevates my brand and also shares my knowledge with folks. Because as soon as someone thinks you're a subject matter expert, they want to now figure out, oh my gosh, I think I have this job, or I want to have you talk to my CEO. And by the way, all this happens before there's a job. Because they want to get that person in front of the right person before it need, is needed. If you look at some of the articles I've written, um, one of the latest articles I wrote was about Apple's new diversity film, because obviously I'm hugely in diversity. That's my background. That's what I really work on right now. So I wrote an article about that. How many of you saw Uber? They were doing a helicopter uh, recently where you can actually rent a helicopter. You can get Uber in a helicopter. I thought that was awesome. So I wrote an article about it, about what's changing in our world today in terms of technology. So whatever it is that you have a passion for, write about it, because guess what? You'll notice that LinkedIn features my articles now. So not only do I share that with my network, LinkedIn picks that up and shares it on their channel with sometimes 200,000 people that I've never met. A lot of CEOs in that, in that realm. This article, which is actually to date my most viewed article, talked about the five most memorable commencement speeches delivered by women. And the reason why I wrote this article, I got very frustrated during the time of commencement speech. And every single list, was every single white man I've ever seen in Oprah. And I thought, I know some women have some smart stuff to share. I want everyone to know about that. Because when I think of great commencement speeches, yeah, I do think of you know, Steve Jobs. But I also think of Oprah. I also think of um, um, the First Lady. I also think of Sheryl Sandberg. And I decided to write an article to showcase their speeches. So whatever you write about, make sure you don't rush to publish the content, but you want to make sure it's high quality and it has a purpose. You should not just publish it just because you want to share your knowledge, but because you really think there's a missing voice in the crowd and that that missing voice needs to be heard. Titles and images matter because it's not, you just want to say, oh, look at this. You have to think about really what are you trying to share with your, with your audience. Who's on Twitter talking about coffee, <laughs> right? Here's what Twitter now has become, and I think it's important to understand that. We started Twitter with a very simple idea. We started it because we wanted to see it. We loved it, and we kept building it because we wanted to see other people use it. There's a series of moments. There's no one big moment, and each time it was like, oh, that's happening? Well, that means this other thing might happen, and then who knows what might happen next. We just never thought it would go this way, and I, I honestly think that's part of the reason why we succeeded. It's such a simple tool, yet people have done so many amazing things with it. We're not able, we may end up in the Suspects in custody, but nobody inside the perimeter. You're able to have these multi-directional conversations. You're not just broadcasting, you're there in the middle of it. I am going to make history here as the first president to live tweet. I'm using Twitter to send pictures and thoughts from space. And every day, I really enjoy reading your tweets. There's an incredible leveling of the playing field that gives every voice the ability to echo around the world instantly. And that democratization of content creation and sharing facilitates these connections that we see every day around the world that we would have never seen before.
the possibilities and the opportunities afforded by the platform are, are limitless. I love it when I send a tweet out and literally someone that has 20,000 followers or 20 million followers retweets it. And I've never met them because they saw value in sharing that with their brand, their audience. Um, I also love the story of Oprah, because people who know me know I'm a huge fan of Oprah. And Oprah um, wore some dress, I think for one time, in some photo shoot. And some lady saw it and said, oh, I would love to have that when I get married someday. And she actually responded and said, tell me your address, I'll send it to you. And she got it. And she said on camera, I don't even have a guy that I'm going to marry right now, but this is what I will wear when I do. <laughs> Um, because it does change things. It's no longer just about saying I had coffee. It's about your brand. It's about elevating your career. It's about connecting with folks who are really knowledgeable. And I didn't say this before about LinkedIn, and I, I, I can't forget. I can't believe I forgot it. But LinkedIn did something this year that also was pretty remarkable. And I'm going to forget the title of it, but I'll tell you the, the the scenario. If you think about all of us take flights across the country all the time, and you never really have a choice of who you sit next to, right? But you, so let's say it's a three-hour flight, or well, let's say five-hour flight. Between here and D.C. is about a five-and-a-half-hour flight between here and D.C. During those five-and-a-half hours, it could be the most per horrible person in the world, or it could be the most great person in the world you're sitting next to. LinkedIn decided to share that and say, you know what, let's say you are sitting next to Oprah. What would you say to her? Because we know Oprah flies. We know that you do. Let us marry the two situations so you actually get a mentoring session in the sky. And that's what they're doing. I think it's Eurus Airways is what they're, they're using Eurus. They've done, I think, three uh, mentoring sessions already. And they pre-select you, you go sign up. And then if you're chosen, you get a chance to sit right next to your mentor for five or whatever time it is to have a really valuable conversation about really substantive stuff about how to move your career forward and all those great things. It's really amazing to me, the power of this platform that we all have access to that some of us forget. It's not about just sharing coffee. It's about how do I really change my brand and my career to be a better person? When you think about Facebook, I know a lot of us use Facebook just to see who posts the latest photo and how many likes we got, but I use Facebook differently. I post, and you can't really see on the screen right now, but I post content about what I think matters in terms of my brand. Some of the same content I post on LinkedIn happens to show up on Facebook. I'll, show, I'll share videos, which I think is substantive. Um, you know, if there's a video around diversity or something I think is really astounding, I'll share that. Because I'm trying to connect with all audiences in all different places. Think about your email when you send an email. Do you think about the fact that your brand is in that email? Like how you wrote it. I know Christy talks about, talked about the language of your emails. But even your email signature. People who know, also know me know I'm a huge techie. You'll see that my signature signs my name on the lower left when I was working at um, NBC Universal. So immediately when I go to networking events, people are like, oh yeah, you're that guy. And that happens because people immediately connect to my brand. They immediately get a feeling about it and I'm memorable. And it's about being memorable in this world where there's so many other people around. It's, remember that Gen Y is 87 million of you. How do you sort of distinguish yourself from just the average person who's applying for that job? My secret number eight is what Christy mentioned before about nurturing your network. If you're not connecting with your network in person, I don't care how many likes you have, I don't care how many connections you have, all you have is a platform of likes and connections that mean absolutely nothing. So you have to figure out how do you translate that into a real person uh, situation. Coming to events like this helps because we all need that human interaction. You know, when you think about a Coke, it doesn't matter what the brand is if I don't taste it. You have to have some sort of a connection with it. Always do coffee or lunch. Keep track and nurture your network. Send them an email or an actual letter. How many th I can tell you when I was at NBC Universal, the folks who sent me an actual letter, and I'll use, where's Mabel? She's in the room. Where are you? Yeah, raise stand up for a second. <laughs> so I just want to know Mabel, once you know Mabel. She's a friend of mine. But the reason why I remember her is because she sent me an actual letter and a card. I think you even sent me a gift card, didn't you? Yeah, I remember that which is why I invited her today, which is why she'll always be a part of my network, which is why I will always remember her. Because it's a feeling. Something happened that's something different than just the average person that sent off an email to me saying, hey, James, I met you at this networking event. 
Know your passion. We talked about this before, but I wanted to share this one last video because I think it's very important, especially for the audience to understand your passion matters. What makes you itch? What sort of a situation would you like? Let's suppose I do this often in vocational guidance of students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we haven't the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? What, how would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that and uh, forget the money. Uh, because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you could eventually become a master of it. The only way to become a master of something is to be really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much, uh, that's, uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. And anything you can be interested in, you'll find others in. But it's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like and doing things you don't like and to teach your children to follow in the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children and educating them to live the same sort of lives we're living in order that they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children, to bring up their children to do the same thing, so it's all wretch and no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question, what do I desire? And that's really what I'm asking you today, is what is it that you desire? I believe at the end of the day, I understand your passion around healthcare. You wouldn't be here otherwise. So what do you desire in that field? What is driving your passion? When you think about City of Hope and some of the values that the company thinks of, what is it that you're trying to fit in to figure out, okay, I want to be known for this? If you think about City of Hope, for example, you'll notice that they are transforming the future of healthcare and the future of health. They're doing that together based on this whole idea of hope. And I like to, one of the things I love, they say every day they're turning science into practical benefit and hope into reality. Compassion, providing exceptional benefit to those that they serve, integrity, those values. When you think about those terms, know that they're not writing that just because they're trying to write this lofty value statement. They're writing that because they're trying to help you understand their brand, their culture. They want you to figure out this is what we stand for. Are, do you see yourselves in that? And if you do, yourself, do see yourselves in that, then how are you making sure they realize that, hey, I want to be here, and this is who I am? How are you sharing that with each of the people you met today? When you think about following up with them, how do you invoke those values? When you look at their website, do you really use the same wording so they understand, yeah, you're family? Because I can tell you, it doesn't matter how many credentials you have. If I don't like you, I'm not going to hire you. And I think likability, you need to understand that matters in this process. And if I think I like you, if I think you're part of my family, I'll go the extra mile to figure out if you're not right right now, I'll mentor you to that next level. How can I get you there? Because mentors only do that when they've invested in you. We don't get paid to be mentors. No one, I don't know anyone that's gotten paid to be someone's mentor, but we do that because we see something in you that we want to grow. So how do you make sure that the people you met today know that there's something in you that they want to grow? 
I do want to open it up for questions. I know we're almost at the end of our time, but I do want to give you an opportunity. If you have direct questions, I want to answer them now. I'll be obviously here for a little bit, uh, and then you can obviously reach me online. But if anyone has questions now, yes, I see your hand there. Do you have, uh, by the way, a microphone or? You're loud, okay. <laughs> provide this uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes. So I, what I will do is I will share it, uh, a link. I didn't think about that. You would think I would have thought about this, right? <laughs> what I'll do is I'll, su I'll supply a link to Kim uh, Costello. Kim is somewhere in the room, I know in the back. And she will make sure that all of you get a link that you can download it, yes. And I'll also share with you all the videos. If you want to watch them on YouTube, they're all on YouTube. Yes. There's a hand over there. Hi, um, I am a career services advisor. I am thoroughly impressed with your LinkedIn timeline video. Thank you. <laughs> what did you use to create that? Yes, everyone loves that thing. So know that uh, what most people don't realize is I'm a culmination. Remember my mother, 20 jobs, et cetera. So I've done a lot of things in my career. I'm a huge techie and I bring all those things to my current role. So I use Apple Motion um, and it's about $50. You can buy it on uh, iTunes. Um, and then I taught myself how to use it to build that. It wasn't hard. Uh, if you're a novice at computers, it could be hard. But I think that if you understand technology, and so a lot of you do in the room, then it really wasn't, it took me literally about two days, and yeah, that was it. Yeah. Any other questions? There's a couple in the front up here. Yeah, <laughs> so I am gonna, um, my business card actually, I purposely, and this slide is out of place clearly for that question, so I'm gonna say thank you first of all. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but my business card, I only brought four, and I'll explain to you why. They're expensive. Uh, my business card, I think it's like, costs like three or four bucks per card. They're actually wooden engraved business cards, because I think your brand is an extension of everything you do. If you think about Oprah, Oprah doesn't do anything halfway. Everything is always special. So there was this guy in Silicon Valley who said, you know, I always go to these networking events, no one remembers me. So he created this Kickstarter program with a wooden and gray business card, and I bought into that on Kickstarter, and now those are my business cards. And I only give them out, it depends on where I go. I only brought four today. But if you were to send a text message, uh, and by the way, they're all gone, by the way. That's what I was gonna say, I've already given them out already. But if you send a text message to 50500 right now, if you send the letters J.W. Sherm, S-H-R-M, it will automatically send you back my electronic business card. You can save it to your phone right now. It works for all phones. So you'll have a way of reaching me. Um, and then if you want to call me or email me, I can definitely contact you that way as well. Yes. Yes. My address, yes. So, I, so if you email me, I'll definitely give you my, okay. my address. Okay. And I I'm trying to no, no, it's okay. Now I will tell you, the first time I was on television, I, I had a weird experience, which is why I don't give people my address every time anymore. <laughs> Someone tried to stalk me. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, but yeah, I don't mind sharing with you because you and I have actually talked a couple of times, so yes. There was a question over there. I don't know where it is, but I, I, there was the one over there. Hi there, uh, quick question. Do you, or do you know where, we can actually go to like a workshop that will help us uh, work on, uh, let's say, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so and so. Um, I know that USC, UCLA, a lot of the colleges uh, in the area do have workshops that they provide on a regular basis to make sure you understand how to do those things. They even provide uh, career stuff around how do you write your resume, because I think it's important to understand what the standard is today. Even though resumes are the formality, you need to understand what we look for. Um, so if, if you look at your college campuses, you can find that. I can provide you, if you email me and uh, uh, definitely call me, I can give you some other resources um, because there's some other nonprofits, like I know NAR, National Association of African Americans in HR, they do also resume writing and other things that they provide you in terms of making sure that you're prepared. So yeah. Any other questions? One in the front. Should you actually be posting your entire resume on LinkedIn? So here's what I tell people. Your resume typically is one to two pages long. I expect you, if you're early career, it should be one page. If it's two pages, I know you're fluffing. <laughs> I know you're just putting a lot of bull stuff in there. 
Um, so I tell people it should be as long as they tell me and understand your resume and your LinkedIn profile should be tailored to what you're looking for. If you want to be a race car driver and I see that you're, everything on your LinkedIn profile says you're an accountant, I'm not going to believe you that you want to be a race car driver. So I need to understand how your experience matches up with your passion. You can't apply for just every single job. I know people do that and I don't think they understand what we think on the other side of that. We think you're unfocused. We don't think that you understand what you want. Because we, we are in a market right now where employers can hire whoever they want. And they can wait as long as they want. And they want the person not only who has the skill set, but they want the person also who has the drive and the passion. And we can't get that from looking at these profiles that aren't focused. So put everything on, in the, on, their matter, on, on there on your profile that matters. On my LinkedIn profile, there are jobs I didn't include. And that's because it doesn't matter for what I'm going after now. If I ever apply for a job in the future, and I can't see myself doing that, but let's say I apply for a job in the future where I want to go back into technology, I want to be an engineer, I would add in that skill set in my LinkedIn profile so people knew about it. So add as much as you want, because it is a long form. You can go as long as you want in the LinkedIn profile. As much as you want, as long as it makes sense for the jobs you're applying for, because the more information you give me, the more likely I get a better view of who you are. And I know we're getting close to the end. I don't want to make anyone mad. Is there a hand right here? Hold on. Let's wait to get out of the microphone because I, I want to make sure that people can hear you. So a great deal of my uh, political or, or my, my professional career has been politically based. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, navigate that without showing too much of your political background when you're searching for a non-political position? Um, so you're talking about like the division of parties, for example. Is that what you mean? Like maybe you're applying for a job and you don't want people knowing you're Republican or Democrat, right. et cetera. Right. Um, labeling, is that what someone um, I think you have to be authentic. Um, so people, I'll change that question around a little bit because I get that same question for, from ethnic minorities who choose they do not want to show their photo because of the idea they think they might be discriminated against. And they think that because I've shown my photo, uh, and they see that I'm African American, um, or if I don't, let's say you don't see it, I get the interview, and guess what? When I show up, they're going to see I'm African American. <laughs> and I've never seen a racist person turn around in a one hour interview. So my point is, is that when you're not authentic, that does change my perception of your brand. I am one of those individuals, I will post everything about me, because I think when you bring me on board, you know what you're getting. I've never, ever gotten a call from a company who says, oh, I was surprised. <laughs> so I would say, be, know who your, what your brand is, and then at the same time, apply for the companies you think will actually value that brand. I don't want to work for a company who doesn't value me. Why would I want to do that? That makes no sense to me. Whoever you are, whether you're Republican, Democrat, I don't care what your affiliation is, make sure that you're true to yourself and authentic. I think that's the best way to be. I do want to wrap it up because I know that we need to go. Thank you so much for your opportunity to be here with you today. And feel free to email and call me because I definitely want to know all of you. And connect with me on LinkedIn. I really want to know all of you. Thank you so much. We're about to start the next networking thank session in a couple minutes. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, let me turn this microphone off.